Uh, whilst they're heading out, so if you want to look up the Bible reading, it's uh, Titus chapter 3, verses 8 to 15, on page 1199 of the Church Bibles. Um, if you haven't got a, one of the Blue Bibles or another form of Bible with you, then I'd strongly encourage you to have one and have it available so that you can uh, open it up during the sermon, because the um, slides will not be up during the um, service, during the sermon. Titus chapter 3, verses 8 to 15. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. As soon as I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, because I've decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Good morning. Let's uh, pray before we come to God's word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you've been here more than a few times... I would hope that you know by now what the message is that we, your elders, your pastors, teach and proclaim and pass on. And if you're relatively new, you'll soon come to realise, hopefully, the same thing. What we teach from the Bible, the good news from the Bible, is that we can be friends with God. Not because we are good people not because we try hard, but simply through trusting in Jesus Christ. This is grace. This is God's free gift of salvation to everyone who believes in Jesus. You see, it's not about what we do. It's about who we trust, who we believe in. So whether you're new to the Christian message, or you've heard it a thousand times, given this emphasis we have on God's grace, you might be forgiven for being a little bit confused, perhaps, about the place of good works, of good deeds, of doing good in the Christian life. If you don't need to be good to become a Christian, why does the Bible also teach that as Christians we should do good? What's the relationship then between grace and good deeds? And really that's what this series in Titus has been all about. Notice the heading there that we've given this series, trusting in God, that is grace, devoted to good. And in this final section of the letter, we get a very clear summary of the overall message of Paul's letter to this man called Titus. And what we find is that it's God's grace that drives a devotion to good. God's grace drives a devotion to good. If you like, God's free gift of salvation is the, it's the engine, it's the motor that drives us to being devoted to doing whatever is good. And just three things then to look at this morning from this passage. Please look, turn it up in your Bible if you uh, have closed your Bible back to Titus chapter 3 as we look at it together. And the first thing we see is this. Remember grace, do good. Remember grace, do good. Look at verse 8 with me. Can you see there the very first few words? Paul writes, this is a trustworthy saying. This saying 
is trustworthy, it is true, it is reliable. Paul is emphasizing that this is especially crucial. It's of vital importance. It's a bit like in a conversation with somebody, you might say, to tell you the truth, or you might say, honestly, hopefully, it doesn't mean the rest of the time you are lying. You're just now emphasizing something of a special importance. And he goes on, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things. Not only is the saying important, he wants Titus, as he leads and pastors the church, to emphasize these things above everything else. And in turn, ever since, all church leaders, all preachers, all elders, all pastors are to stress these same things. So hopefully by now you're all asking the same question, if you've been awake for the last minute or so. What is the trustworthy saying that we are to stress? And it's what he's just written, if you cast your eye back to verses 3 to 7. And Mark explained these verses to us two weeks ago, so I don't want to repeat everything Mark said, otherwise the sermon will be twice as long as normal. But a quick summary of the highlights. Verse 3, look at that there. Paul is saying that we were not nice people. He's saying we were enslaved by all kinds of passions and full of hatred. But verse 4, he says then, but the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared. That's when Jesus, God's Son, came to earth to live and to die and to be raised again, as we remembered last Sunday. And when the kindness and love of God, our Saviour, appeared, verse 5, he saved us. Not because of the good things that we do. It wasn't our good works that saved us. Instead, he saved us because of God's mercy. It was an act of undeserved grace. And then verse 6, God has generously poured out the Holy Spirit on us. That all Christians trusting in Jesus receive the Holy Spirit so that, verse 7, having been justified, having been declared, God declares us to be in the right before him by his grace. We might become God's heirs, having the hope of eternal life. That is the saying that Paul says is trustworthy and is to be stressed and emphasized. In other words, he's saying, to summarize very briefly, God's grace has saved us from our sinful way of life so that we now have the sure and certain hope of eternal life, a life that starts now and never ends. So we are to remember grace. Grace comes first. And this is the message that we stress. And if we don't stress this message, then please come and tell us and warn us that we're not stressing the right thing. This is the most important thing that we are to be telling you as we speak. Remind us that we are to proclaim the good news, that we don't have to be good enough to come to God. In fact, we cannot be good enough for him. You see, the message is you just need to come to Jesus, confessing that you are not good enough, that you are a sinner, and believe that Jesus died for your sins and trust him for your salvation. So why are we to stress Why is this the most important thing we have to say? First, of course, so that people will hear the good news of grace and they will respond to it so that people who realise that they need forgiveness, that they need God, will know how they can come to God and receive salvation, forgiveness and eternal life. It's the only way to God. But why are we to stress the message to people those who have already believed to Christians. Why do Christians, why do we need to hear about God's grace? 
Well, Paul explains in verse 8. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. We're to stress grace so that we'll be out of grace as a response to God's grace, devoted to doing what is good. That is of the relationship, as Mark explained two weeks ago, between grace and doing good. Grace is the engine, it's the motor that enables and drives us to do good, to be devoted to doing good. We're devote, to be devoted to doing good because God has freely forgiven us. He has poured out his blessings on us. He's given us the Holy Spirit to change and transform us. So there's a sense in which if, if you've trusted in Jesus, you can't help but do good because the Holy Spirit is transforming you and me. We have, as Paul writes earlier, we have been reborn, renewed. We are, Paul says elsewhere, a new creation. So, of course, there is a change between the before and the after. Before we trusted in God, we were one thing. Now we are different people. We are reborn. We are renewed. So no longer should we be centered on ourselves, on our own needs and wants, but focused on putting the needs of others first. But it doesn't all happen kind of instantly. Paul writes here that because of God's grace, Christians should devote themselves to doing good. In other words, there's an action to take. We are actively to seek to be dedicated to doing good to others. And this is first, it's the evidence that we have been saved. It's kind of like a proof, if you like, that we have been saved. And it's also the purpose of our salvation. It's why we've been saved. It's to be expected that all Christians will be equipped and ready to do good works. Just in the previous chapter, chapter 2, verse 14, if you cast your eye down to that, Paul has written this. Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us, to buy us out of all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. I wonder, are you eager to do what is good? Do you want to do good to and for other people? Is that what you desire? Are, are we devoted to doing what is good? In what ways are we doing good for others? Let's think, what opportunities are there for us to do good in our communities where we live, the places where we work, or in the church as well? So that's the first thing. Remember grace. Do good. But secondly, reject legalism. Warn the divisive. Reject legalism. Warn the divisive. See, Paul goes on to warn Titus to avoid legalism. Legalism is the idea that Christianity is all about do's and don'ts that it's all about doing certain things, what we might call religious observances. He writes in verse 9, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law. I guess if you went out into the high street today and asked many people what they thought a Christian was or what it meant to be a Christian, they'll say things like doing good deeds and being charitable, praying, going to church a lot. You may have heard this before, but Christian singer Keith Green once said, going to church a lot doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. These good things aren't what it is to be a Christian. These performances, these do's and don'ts. You see, the problem is that if we have a legalism, it completely ignores grace that we've just been speaking about. If it's that we come to God through all the things that we do, that leaves no room for God's grace. So we're to reject any notion of legalism. 
As Paul writes, verse 9, these are unprofitable and useless. Legalism actually gets you nowhere in the end. There's no upside to it. And actually worse, because it leaves no room for grace, for God's grace, God's mercy, it will take you away from God rather than bringing you closer to him. You see, the more that you rely on your own efforts and good behavior to be saved or to please God, the further you will be away from that end. And that's why Paul tells Titus to warn people who are pushing legalism. They're pushing legalism in the church. He says, warn these people. And after two warnings, have nothing whatsoever to do with them, which seems really harsh, doesn't it? That's because such people, those who will push legalism, they're a danger not just to themselves, but to the whole church and to everyone they meet because they're leading away from grace. But nonetheless, there is still that grace, if you like, of the warning that such people should be warned before Titus is to turn away from them. This morning, if you think you can earn your way to God, if you think that doing certain religious acts or good deeds or charitable things will lead you closer to God, please be warned that, as Paul says, that way just lies self-condemnation because you can actually never live up to that anyway. And relying on your own efforts has no upside. So if that describes you this morning, please will you turn away from your own efforts and come to God and humbly admit and confess your failures and all that you've done wrong and ask him to save you, not because of your best efforts, not because you're trying hard, not because you're, well, you're better than most people. Ask him to save you just out of his mercy and his grace. The only way to God is to trust in Jesus Christ who died on the cross to save you from your sins. I wonder, will you turn to him even now in the quietness of this moment and ask him to save you? You see, Christianity isn't about laws. There is no big tick list of do's and don'ts that we have to fulfill and kind of get eight out of ten or ten out of ten. It's not a tick list of behavior. It's about a relationship, a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And even amongst believers, there can be a tendency towards legalism. Legalism can exist even inside the church. And when it does, it can lead to a divisive spirit. Perhaps you have experience with this, where someone perhaps is arguing that Christians must do certain things. There are certain things that to be a proper Christian, you have to do this, this, and this, and this, even though these things aren't commanded in the scriptures. Or that Christians must not do something. You know, mustn't do this or this or this. Even, those thi- though, even though those things are not condemned in the Bible as wrong. Titus is to have nothing to do with divisive people who are pushing legalism if they will not respond to the warning that he gives them. So can I urge you this morning, if, if you kind of see any hint of that legalism or that divisiveness inside of you, please don't be that person anymore. Repent of that desire to impose your kind of ideas of what a Christian is on other people that is not in the Bible. Repent of that and return to the gospel of grace. So remember grace, do good. Reject legalism, warn the divisive. And thirdly, we'll end on a positive note, resound in love and help others. Resound in love and help others. And we come to the end of the letter, and you'll see the heading in the 
NIV is final remarks, and usually the letters end with final remarks or final greetings, which are very unhelpful titles that the translators give these passages. But in these verses, Paul gives examples and a final encouragement to being devoted to doing good because of God's grace. Always remember grace. And in, this, in these few verses, if you cast your eye over them, you will see his great love for other people. For Titus in particular, he wants Titus to come and, uh, and spend time with him in, as he winters in Nicopolis. And then these two guys, Artemis and Tychicus, they're two of Paul's closest friends, closest companions, who traveled with him. And he's now sacrificially planning to send one of them to Titus. He loves them, but he loves Titus as well. And then he urges Titus to help these guys called Zenus and Apollos on their way, even though one of them's a lawyer. But no, he seriously urges them to help them on their way because they're believers who need to be helped on their way out of Christian love. Whatever they need as they're traveling through where Titus is through Crete, help them on their way. And all of Paul's company, all those who are with Paul, they send their greetings to Titus. Some may not have met Titus, but they're still willing, they're still sending their greetings to him out of Christian love. And then Paul tells Titus to pass on his greetings to all who know and love him in the faith. This is that picture, isn't there, of a loving community, of people who love each other and help one another. It's because of grace, and because of grace, because of what Jesus has done, there is now a new people worldwide who are related to one another in love through Jesus Christ. And this is the church across the world. This is what it means to be a Christian. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're part of a community of love that spans the globe. You may have heard the expression that blood is thicker than water. Have you heard that? which kind of means that your family ties, <clears throat> your siblings and, and your children and so on, that your bond with them is closer than any other bond you could possibly have, closer than any other relationship. But I believe the death of Jesus changes that. Now, water is thicker than blood. And I mean, of course, the water of baptism. The water of baptism, when you're baptized in the water, it represents you joining the worldwide body of Christ, as is seen evidenced locally in this church. And now as a Christian, the relationships that you have through Jesus with other believers are the closest bonds that you have, closer even than family. And so we love one another. We are to resound in love. This, of course, is one reason to reject legalism and a divisiveness that breaks the precious bonds that we have, the precious bonds we share as we love one another in the faith. And true love, real love, strong love always results in actions, in doing. Because love without action isn't love at all, is it? <clears throat> if you see someone in urgent need and you can help them and you do nothing, is that love? If you see a brother or sister in need and you can provide their need and you do nothing, is that love? And so Paul writes, because we are to resound in love, verse 14, cast your eye down there with me. He says, our people, in other words, Believers across the world, the church, our people. You see that again? It's our people, people who belong to one another. They must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. And so we are to help one another. And I think by and large we do that pretty well in the church. At Pontry Drin, we're a loving church. We see people in need. We will help them. 
I'm sure there's more we could do in this respect. And maybe there are just two particular dangers or, or failings in us. First of all, many of us actually struggle to be vulnerable and to ask for help when we need it. Or we think we don't need others to help us so much. Perhaps, for example, you don't like the idea of someone coming to visit you because, after all, I'm not housebound, I'm not very sick, I don't need a visitation. Perhaps you might be hesitant to let others know when you're struggling. So others are then actually, not only can they not help you, but they're denied the joy and privilege of helping you. And of course, there's that British disease, and I suffer from this greatly, like I think we all probably do. So I'm going to ask you, how are you? And it's fine. How are you? I'm okay. You okay? Yeah. And sometimes that's the right response. But maybe sometimes we should be prepared to share our needs with others. The problem, you see, is our pride. We can easily be too proud, A, to admit we're struggling, or to even admit so that we, because we don't want others to help us, we want to we do it by ourselves. Too proud to allow others to get close. And then there could be a second danger as well, that, that maybe for some of us we become so focused on our own needs that we forget other people. And, and sometimes our, our needs are great and that's a natural response, but, but perhaps in our conversations with other believers in the church, we only ever talk about our, us and ourselves. And we never ask, well, how are you? The conversations can be all about us and we're not loving others in doing that. And I'm sure there are other ways in which we can improve in helping one another, in showing love to one another, because we are to be a loving community, helping one another in our needs. And this will show others that we are followers of Jesus. Jesus himself spoke to his closest friends, knowing he was going to the cross. In John chapter 13, he gave them this commandment, Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Did you see that? He said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. How has Jesus loved us? His love for us took him to the cross. We're to love one another the same way. The sermon is titled Grace. Grace. We're saved purely by God's mercy, not because of any good that we may do or try to do or our best efforts. Now, this morning, if you haven't yet trusted in Jesus, or if you're not sure about the whole thing, about where you'll stand. Well, soon we're going to be running a course in which you can explore the Christian faith. And if you're interested in, 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 in doing that course, please have a chat to me or one of the other elders to know if you'd like to think about that. You don't need to do the course to become a Christian. As I've already said, you can put your faith and trust in Christ right now. But if you'd like to explore it further, then we're going to be running this course, so please let us know. And for those of us who have put their faith in Christ, who are trusting in Jesus, we're to be devoted to doing good. God's grace drives a devotion to good. Remember grace, do good. Reject legalism, warn the divisive. Resound in love and help others. Now, there may be one thing in particular that God has been saying to you this morning you want to think about and reflect on. One thing you want to change, or one thing you need to do. Let's just take a few moments of quiet to think about that, to meditate on, and then I will pray.
Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the grace you have shown in Jesus Christ, that when he appeared, it was that your kindness and love appearing. And thank you for pouring out your grace into the lives of many of us this morning. Pray for those who have not yet put their faith and trust in Christ. May they, may they see their need and see that Jesus is the only way that they can, their need can be met. And Father, just pray you would help us to, uh, to be devoted as your believers, as your people, to, to be devoted to doing good so that others may be helped and aided and so also others may see the effect that grace has and be attracted to want to know more as well. Amen.